This is a dairy meeting at the National Convention, NFO, at the Indianapolis, and Al Scott will open the meeting. We'll start this meeting because we do have to run these meetings on schedule uh, so that they correspond with uh, the next meeting coming up at those of you that might want to go to another commodity meeting. I welcome you to the dairy commodity meeting today. And today we will be looking into the future a bit with some projections on the outlook of the dairy situation by Ted McCarty. We'll be going into our training program, our team efforts with Ted Strait. We will, at this meeting, we have uh, Rick Avila from the Northeast who will be reporting on his particular area. We also want to invite all of you to come back to our three o'clock meeting. We will be having a guest speaker at that time. We will also be awarding a plaque to the area that has put on the most production, the largest percentage increase in the last year. This plaque, and it will be awarded to Steve Pavich and the Wisconsin group at our next meeting. I just wanted to show you what we're, pretty nice trophy. This will be a traveling award. The area that wins it each year will get to keep it. There's quite a few pl uh, plates on there where we can keep a record of those areas. Incidentally, it was real close this year. I believe about three producers uh, for another unit would have swung it in their direction. So it was a real close contest, but uh, the Wisconsin boys did win it. Come back at our next meeting when we award it to those people. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ted McCarty to give you a outlook on the dairy situation for the next year. We've been hearing a lot of doom and gloom since we've been down here, long before we came down here. So I don't want to break the trend right now. I want to give you some statistics that the government economists, state university economists, are giving to us. For instance, milk production during October of 1981 was 2.7% above October of last year. And it was 6.7% above October of 79. Milk production for all of 1981 will total approximately 132 billion pounds, which will be one of the highest production years of milk in the history. And this is 3% above 1980 and 7% above 1979 production. There's every indication that it will continue to grow for most of 82. Uh, the factors are there. Uh, probably be 2 to 3% higher in 1982 than it was in the record year of, that we're in right now of 1981. Consumption of dairy products in the last three or four months have increased about 1%. Uh, this is a trend, again, going along with the economists of cheap food prices. Because we haven't had any increases in milk in the last year. So they're saying people are drinking more. Well, malarkey, that's not the case. The population is increasing each year by approximately that figure. So it's not that each person is drinking more milk, we're just getting more people to drink it. So the factors that are present, and we can't ignore them, that will bring about, that have brought about increased production, and will continue to bring it about in 1982, is production per cow increased 2 to 3 percent over the last two years, each year over the last two years. Now, we're expecting production per cow to increase approximately 1% during 1982. 
But the number of milking cows is the greatest in history right now. We've got approximately 1% more cows being milked today than we have before. Another factor is the replacements. We're at the highest level we've ever been at, about 5.6% higher than last year, or about 46 cows or 46 heifers for every 100 milking cows. <clears throat> now, as those cows come in and the beef prices stay low, it's going to increase milk production. No question about it. Concentrates have been cheaper. Hay has been cheaper. Again, factors leading to increased production per cow. So the milk production is going to be here in 82, just like it was in 81, even more. Now we can get into the dairy support program. Uh, Chuck Frazier yesterday went over the farm bill some with you. The dairy support program and the new farm bill is pretty well firmed up now. Uh, they had a different version in the House and one in the Senate. The Senate uh, House Conference Committee came out with a compromise and established a minimum of 70 percent. And that's 5 percent lower than the law that's been on the books since 1936, the Agricultural Stabilization Act said the minimum price support shall be between 75 and 90 percent. And many of you, I'm sure, will recall on October 1st of this year, <coughs> the support price went up because it was dictated under law to go up to 75 percent. But the markets didn't react, nothing reacted, because we all knew that it was only temporary until the legislature got around to freezing the prices. And that has been done, and the price is now established, the same as it has been at the same level, at $12.80 for milk testing 3.5% butterfat. And October of 1982, they put in trigger mechanisms for the next four years to mandate increases in support prices. And the trigger mechanism is based upon the amount of milk equivalent that the government buys. Now, in 1982, October 1st, 1982, which is the next marketing year, <laughs> they'll stay at 70% unless the government purchases less than 4 billion pounds milk equivalent. Milk equivalent being the amount of milk it takes to make butter, powder, and cheese, which the government purchases. On October 1st, 1983, it would still remain at 70 percent unless the projected purchases by the government are less than 3.5 billion pounds milk equivalent. In October of 1984, the minimum would be 70 percent or 75 if the projections are that the government will purchase less than 2.69 billion pounds. Now, from all indications, the government economists and everything else that was just handing you a little candy stick and then taking it away because it really doesn't mean anything because all the government predictions of what they're going to purchase in the next four years are considerably higher than these trigger mechanisms. So we're very doubtful that the purchases will drop below these trigger mechanisms to raise it above 70 percent of support. Uh, so I don't believe that we'll see anything above 70 percent of support for the next three or four years. Now, the milk prices uh, during 1982 are going to remain relatively stable, in my opinion. 
I don't see any drastic increases or drastic decreases. But our costs are going to be rising. There's no question about that. We all know that. And government uses price as a tool to drive down what they call surplus production of milk. And how do they use price as a tool to drive down their definition of surplus production of milk? By getting it so low that they'll put enough dairy farmers out of business that we won't have the production. Simple solution for the budget cutters. <clears throat> Dr. Jacobson, from economist from Ohio State, just wrote a paper, just published, and in that study of his, with all his charts and graphs and the economist models and everything else, he said that the price of milk had to drop $2.62 per hundredweight before the supply line and the demand line met. And by dropping $2.62 a hundredweight, that would put enough dairy farmers out of business that then we'd be just producing just what was needed to be consumed in this country. So this is the gloom situation as pointed out. The economists are saying it, the government's saying it, the cooperatives are saying it, but I say throw it out the window because we're not painting a picture of doom and gloom. I remember last year when the co-ops, Midam being one of them, sent out letters, they were making speeches to their members that milk is going to drop a dollar a hundred weight this spring. That was last spring. The Minnesota Wisconsin price series during the flush period has only dropped 21 cents. So it wasn't all that much doom and gloom. And the support price we don't really need to count on anyway because it's at 1280. The Minnesota Wisconsin price series which is the basic formula for setting milk throughout the United States, is at $2.64. So we're way below support now. So that's not going to help. So let's throw out the doom and gloom and look at the National Farmers Organization Dairy Program. That's what we've got to do. We as your staff, you as the membership and producing members. Last year, and I'm not taking full responsibility, or the organization isn't, for the price only dropping 21 cents rather than the predicted dollar. But we did increase our volume going through the National Farmers Organization by 12%. We've set our goals this year higher than that. Last year we set them at 10, we made 12. This year we set them higher, and their minimum goals for attainment. So we're going to throw away the doom and gloom and we're going to work on our program because we know it'll work and we know it will succeed. There is light at the end of the tunnel. So don't buy all the doom and gloom. It's not going to come easy. But we at this convention and you, the leadership of this organization, can make that light come closer. We have the only program in the National Farmers Organization that can obtain cost of production plus a profit. <coughs> the other organizations, dairy organizations, like what they call surplus milk because surplus milk means cheap milk. And they've got plants that they've got to keep running. And if they don't have this excess milk, they can't run their plants. And most of them are inefficient, so they've got to get cheap milk to run their manufacturing plants. 
if production was cut down so that it would all be consumed in the fluid market and the commercial market, those plants would sit idle. They don't want that. So they're not pushing for a higher priced milk because they're wearing two hats. One is a processor where they have to make money. The other one, supposedly to represent the dairy farmer. But it can't be done, believe me. We have only one purpose, and that's to represent the dairy farmer and achieve our goal of reaching cost of production plus a profit. And I'm not telling you we're going to do it tomorrow or next month. But if we continue on our planned program, we will reach it. Now, the plans that we have for this year in the dairy program are very similar to what they were last year. Certain changes, but the number one problem, as Devon told you last night, we're a collective bargaining organization, and there's a difference between collective bargaining and marketing. And frankly, what we're doing today is marketing because we don't have the volume to collective bargain with. But that's coming. And we can't look for pie in the sky. It's got to be planned, methodical, step by step by step. So we've got incentive programs for our employees. All the employees in the dairy department, in their areas, in their regions, have been established quotas of what we expect out of them, out of their areas for this year. Because everybody pulling together and them getting the production, then we'll meet our national goals with no problem. And we'll be over them. We're ver working very hard on personnel training, telling the story of the National Farmers Organization. Devon alluded again to this last night when he said the National Farmers Organization, all commodity departments, is the best kept secret in America. And we have found that out. And we found out that we do have a lot to sell. We have a lot of benefits in this organization. But our people were not effectively conveying that message. So we set up training sessions for all of our people. I can remember a time, and I haven't been with the organization but four years now, when we would hire somebody let him sit around the office for a couple of days and get to know the people around the office and drink some coffee. We give him about two days. Then we give him a stack of membership agreements and dairy authorization. We say, go get them. That was the extent of his training program. He was lost. He was dumbfounded. He didn't have the tools. So now we're giving him the tools with our training program. Test straight will go into that to tell you how these are working, but it's been one of the biggest successes that we've done in this organization in the dairy department is to train the people how to convey the message of the benefits of the National Farmers Organization and do it in an effective manner. What we used to do before was argue. Guys say no, we say why not? Boom, 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 back and forth. We never told them anything. We got to one point, we'd stay there and argue about it. Never told him what the organization was about and never asked him to join. We frankly were being outsold in the field. But now we have extensive training programs. Upgrading personnel. 
We're continuously changing people. I feel very confident in the staff that we have in this dairy department today. Always room for improvement everywhere. We'll continue to change. We'll continue to upgrade. But I think we've come a long way in the last three or four years in upgrading our personnel, getting better qualified people and training them. It's proven results. <coughs> the use of procurement teams. We used them extensively last year. Ted Strait will tell you more about that. We plan on using them this year. We've been using them now for about a year and a half. But we've got to keep changing those because it's a fast changing world. And you've got to keep changing your policies to keep up with what's going on. And what works fine for six months may stagnate later. When it does, then you've got to crank it up, revise it, but just put fine-tune it a little more to make it more effective. That's what we're going to do in 1982. Negotiating contracts. We're negotiating more contracts now than we ever have before. We've got most of them year-round contracts. We've got most of them now where they're coming up in the fall. And that took us quite a while to get changed around. Because you certainly don't want to go out and try to negotiate a contract in May, which is the highest production month in the year. You want to negotiate, negotiate your contracts in November, September through November, when the production is down and consumption is up. And that's where we changed them to. Because don't try to talk to a buyer in May when everybody's knocking on his door trying to sell him milk. But you can get them in the fall, and that's what we're doing now. We've got uh, Wisconsin in November uh, couldn't fulfill all their contracts. Uh, they had to start switching milk around. We didn't have enough milk in the program in Wisconsin, even though they got the top award and they had a nice increase. But they've got good contracts. They've got an excellent program. We could have entered more contracts this fall, if we had the production. Now it's coming, and it, the problem is reversed. It used to be we had too, many, too much milk and not enough contracts. Now in most areas, we are getting contracts, particularly our bedrock areas of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Ohio, uh, the ones we've been in for a long time have got strong programs. Uh, the Northeast, we've still got not as strong program as we need, uh, and that's a completely different story, but we're going to work on that. We've already made some changes. Rick is area director of New England now, and he'll tell you what he's been doing out there. But I know that last month he was looking for milk, too, in uh, Maine and Vermont. So we're going to we're negotiating better contracts. We're going to be working, but we need the help of all the members because we've got to work together as a team. We found out our procurement teams are just a complete El Flopo if we don't have the cooperation of the leadership of this organization and helping us. We've gone into areas where we've had it, and we've gotten great success. We've gone into areas where we haven't had it, and they haven't been so hot. But we're respected by industry now as a reliable supplier of milk. And that's an image problem we had to overcome. And they're talking about the image problem of the organization. That's an image problem we had to overcome. We've done that now. And we're accepted by industry, and we can negotiate contracts.
Thank you. The next speaker will be Ted Strait talking about our training program and our teams. There's a little story behind Ted. He's, he's a fellow we're real proud of. We started out in training our staff and our teams with outside help and found that after a few of these sessions that we could handle it within our own department. Ted has taken over that training. He's done an excellent job in training our teams throughout the country. In fact, he's done so well that we now have him helping out train some of the meat people and some of the grain staff. So we've kept him real busy in training and holding the team efforts together. So I'll turn it over to Ted Strait. Thank you, Al. Again, I'll introduce myself. My name is Ted Strait. I'm with the National Farmers Organization Dairy Division, and I'm here to talk to you today about how further training our staff will not only increase the production more rapidly into the programs that you people have, but also further collective bargaining, which means more money in your pocket, and we can all use a little more money in our pocket, couldn't we? The thing last year, Al Scott made a statement that when we started this training, we found out one thing. We had one of the best programs available, and we do in the National Farmers Organization. But the problem we had was we were getting outsold in the field. We had the inability to convey the product that we had. Al turned that around. We not only turned it totally around, but we put a 12 to 12 and a half percent increase of production through the National Farmers Organization in one year's time. They mentioned we had goals set up for next year, and we do. We all have goals set up in our life, whether they be personal or what else. I'm going to tell you about one that Al fulfilled here just a little while ago. Al became director of the National Farmers Organization's Dairy Department, and in doing this, he wanted to keep up with the image a little bit. So he goes out and trades his car. Al didn't get a new car, but he'd done some shopping. He's a good businessman in that aspect. We all do when we shop for tractors. We look for the bargains and things like this. Well, Al went out and found a real nice, clean 76 or 77 Ford LTD. Absolutely beautiful. He brought it down to the home office and we looked at it and it's got nice paint on it. It's clean, very low mileage and everything. Al says got a lot of power too. She'll go right down the road. Gas mileage isn't too bad when he purchased it. Real proud of it. So proud of it that when he headed down for a convention, him and his wife Elaine stopped in uh, Creston, Iowa to get some gas. Well, when he pulled into the gas station, this farmer in this little Volkswagen pulled in behind him. Got out and he had his bibbed overhauls on and the whole works. Come up admiring Al's car. Well, Al's pretty proud of it. Let him go. Went in to pay for the gas. Looks, turns around when he's out there and there's a guy sitting behind the wheel of the car going, boom, 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 real pleased. Al says, well, that's going about far enough. He went out there and the guy says, you know, just admiring your car, sir. He says, I haven't seen anything like that much. And Al says, that's fine. Got under the wheel of the car, going to show off a little bit, pulled out into the street, spun the tires a little bit, and took off down the road. I was cruising down the road, Highway 34, at about 50, 55 mile an hour. Looks in his rear view mirror, and here comes his Volkswagen. Just hit, boom, right out around him. Al looks up ahead of him, Lord, here it comes back. Just, boom, right on back past him. Al says, well, I'm not going to put up with this, so he kicks the Ford and the hind end a little bit. Gets her up to about 70, 75 mile an hour, looks in the rear view mirror, and Lord, here comes this Volkswagen. Just, right out around him. Looks up and here it comes back up over the hill, just right back over him again. Al says, that's enough. He floorboards her, gets her up to 100, 110, 115, and here come this Volkswagen, just right around him. Right back past him. Al says, I can't take her. Hits his kids, pull her over to the side of the road, and this Volkswagen pull right in behind him. Just Al jumps out of the car and he says, man, he says, what do you got under the hood of that car? And the guy says, that ain't it, partner. I just wanted you to let my suspenders out of the door. <laughs> Al just passed me a note and said I can start my speech next time by saying I used to work for the National Farmers Organization Dairy Department. <laughs> I say we all have goals set up in the National Farmers Organization, and part of reaching these goals is properly trained staff. Like I said before, we started it when we found out that the, most of the people out here knew exactly 
what they wanted to say about the National Farmers Organization. They were long on what we call product knowledge. They knew about the National Farmers Organization. The only thing that they failed to do was have the ability to convey their knowledge across. And this is what the training has helped do. We start out with what we call the approach in training. We're training them on sales techniques. And the approach is the first step. This is when you drive in the driveway, walk up to the guy's place. Now, a lot of you have had salesmen come onto your place for selling feed or uh, seed corn or whatever. And there's three questions that pop in your mind. Who is this guy? What is he selling or who does he represent? And why in the world should I take the time to listen to him, don't you? All right, we train him in answering those three questions. Now, most of our staff out here has got the first one handled. You know, who they are. They can handle that one. And if they don't, like Shelley, we put a name tag on him so we can get him going. Who they work for is relatively simple. But answering the third question has got to turn on the man's receiver. It's a benefit to him, how you will benefit. Is there anybody here from Kentucky? Oh, man, you know Joey Hayden. Right. I'm going to give you an example of how not to do it. Joey's a good young staff man that we've got, and he was out on one of the team efforts in Pennsylvania. Joey's got a beautiful presentation to give to the people, but he was having a hard time getting into the door to do it. So I went out with him one day. Joey's walking up, and he says, my name is Joey Hayden. I'm with the New National Farmers Organization. I'd like to have a little bit of your time. Guy says, I'm busy, immediately. So I said, Joey, you're not turning on the man's receiver. You've got to answer that third question. So we sit down and devised one. Very simple. My name is Joey Hayden. I'm with the New National Farmers Organization. And I come to talk to you today how to put more money in your pocket. We'd all like to have more money in your pocket, wouldn't we? Yes. So Joey studies it and studies it and studies it. He walked out the first day, the first contact, and said, my name is Joey Hayden. I'm with the New National Farmers Organization. I come to talk to you today how to put more money in my pocket, and we'd all like to see more money in my pocket, wouldn't we? <laughs> the guy looked at him right square in his big blue eyes, and he says, yeah, and I know how you're doing it. I got a letter on my desk from the attorney. You're suing me for $600 worth of back dues. <laughs> now, that is the truth. Joey did not get that guy. <laughs> he nailed him down. He closed him. He done everything he could, but he couldn't get back on track. The success story part of that was he did sign three people that day. And he got one to come to a meeting that night and got him, so he got four new members that day. So it does work. We then school him on the visit period. Now, a lot of us out here have been nothing but professional visitors and never got down to the meat of the program. But the visit period is nothing more than setting the stage for your presentation. It makes a relaxed atmosphere and gets the guy to open up and talk to you. After that, then, we do go into what we call the positive presentation. Now, I put a lot of emphasis on positive. Devon talked last night about the survey that was just conducted, and one of the problems being image. Image is a problem because of what we used to do to go out here. Used to walk out and talk to people by telling them that if you don't join the National Farmers Organization, you're going to go broke because the government ain't going to do it for you, and your co-op ain't going to do it, and everything else, and preaching doom and gloom. Now, really, the guy doesn't want to know who isn't going to do it for him, does he? He wants to know what is going to do it for him. So it's a lot nicer to go out and say, with the National Farmers Organization's collective bargaining programs, we can stair-step the price to cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Paints a lot different picture, doesn't it? Explaining to him what benefits and what programs we have, not his old marketing system and the way that he has been doing it, and calling him a dummy in an aspect, what we're doing. We also teach the art of good words and the difference of bad words. There are certain words that turn on people's receivers and ones that don't. One of the biggest problems and fallacies I've found out here on the road was walking up to a guy and say, we're out here trying to put on producers. Wrong. We are out here putting on producers, aren't we? There's a lot of difference. The word I think, when you say I think, you're leaving doubt in his mind. I know the collective bargaining will work, don't you? You bet. Okay. We move then into the art of nail downs. Nail downs are simply nothing more than so you can understand that the man understands you. Nail down is simply a statement that wouldn't it and getting the guy to say yes. It also sets the stage for a close. Now, last year, Al Scott gave the example of the guy that walked out and finally closed a sale out on one of the teams. He says, the sweat broke out, it ran down the middle of my back, and he says, and on my forehead. He says, I could have just died. You ask the same man that same question today, and he'll give you a complete different answer. Because you close after a benefit, and after the man understands the benefit, and the nail down lets you know that he does. Very good. 
<coughs> excuse me. We also teach them when to close. You close early and often. Now, I have walked onto the man's place and signed him within just a couple of minutes. Got him enrolled in the organization. Now, the question pops in your mind, yes, but don't you want him to understand what we're doing? Certainly. Nobody made any rules at all just because he signed when I first walked in there that you can't sit down and explain the whole program to him, can you? And you can. There's one thing about it. When he does invest and purchase something, when you go ahead and explain it to him, then he is looking at all the positives of it. Just like Al Scott when he went and traded that car. He drove that other car in there to trade off. The salesman come out there and talk to him about it. Al says, old Betsy here is a beautiful car. She's got 150,000 miles on her. I've never put a wrench to her. She's been shedded all her life. The paint is good. Don't use any oil, maybe a quarter every 1,500 miles. Hate to get rid of her. I shouldn't. Probably the wrong thing to do. And he goes over and looks at the new car he's going to purchase, and he says, well, I was kind of looking for a two-door, but I suppose this four-door will be all right. Color's not exactly what I wanted. Maybe a cigarette burn on the floor. But I'll guarantee you, when he endorses the papers there and the guy hands him the keys and he drives out, that's the best car he ever bought in his life, and he's sure glad he got rid of that old piece of junk. <laughs> that's right, and that's the way it works with him. We also go into what we call the objection formula, how to handle objections and questions without getting into arguments. Now, we find so many times we go out there, we walk onto a guy's place, and he says, boy, he says, you guys are too darn radical. You're wasting your time here. I ain't going to mess with you. And all of a sudden, we brussel up, and we get squared off, and we have one of the nicest little arguments you've ever seen in your life, don't we? We may have won the battle, but we sure haven't won any wars yet, have we? What we do, we teach them how to handle that. The first thing you've got to remember about an objection is that it is a definite buying sign. Now, that is kind of hard to believe when a guy's got a pitchfork in your face saying, get off my place, isn't it? It's kind of hard to believe that he's actually begging you he wants to join the National Farmers Organization. Only thing that an objection is, is means that he is interested in that one certain aspect, that one part. You answer his question there, and that might have been the only thing in the world that ever kept him from joining the National Farmers Organization. So we teach him how to do that. How we train is we set it up to begin with, with in-class instruction. We set the tables in a little horseshoe, so they're all facing each other. They have in-class participation, and we go through the selling techniques, which takes about two and a half days. We then went around with a refresher course on this in the same manner. Then we went in to the team efforts. The team efforts, as you'll remember, what we got labeled as a SWAT team last year. We've revised that a little bit and put it in as what we call a procurement team. <laughs> Now, what they get the opportunity to do is actually physically go out and apply these techniques in the field. They go out, and then every night they come back in, they sit down, and we evaluate every contact that they had. What did they do? How could they have done it better? How would they have handled this objection? Drill and work on it. Practical application. It works like a dream. What 30 people you get sitting in a room and give them the selling techniques behind class, one picks up certain aspects of it, another one picks up different parts of it. When they come in the room that night of being on the road, they can help each other, saying, well, I understood this part of it, and this is how I handle it. The other guy says, this is how I handle this one. The product knowledge also comes in great right there, too. They can exchange ideas, product knowledge, and train them, in which we have to do of the new staff and people that we are hiring all the time now anyway. Ted mentioned that we used to hire them, give them a book, let them sit around the office a couple of days, and say, hit the road, Jack, get her done. Now we have a training program, and we're going to further it to be able to train the people to put them out on the road so they have the confidence. And the confidence is nothing more than knowing that you know. And when they have that feeling, they can go out and get the job done. And I can see Dave Casino sitting here. He's a tremendous man we got from Minnesota. And like I told Dave and one of them, there's one thing you got to remember about confidence. The difference between confidence and cockiness is a very fine line, Dave. Very good. Okay. The team efforts that we do have out there, like Ted said, have been very successful only when it's been set up properly, when you people want them. The team members, when you people put the list of names together, when you're there and got the writers lined up and are going to show for us down the road to show us where to go, everything else in the advertisement, the whole works, and have the meeting ahead of time, I'll tell you people, it works. It definitely does work. The teams itself are responsible for approximately a little over 180 million pounds of milk that went on the truck last year. That's annual production. Now, that's not counting what the guys are self done in their own area when they got back. But the team efforts will work, and they'll work when they're set up properly. 
if you've got one in your area that you want to have, get a hold of your local staff people, whatever, and follow the right channels on that. We'll get it done. We all have our goals, like I said, and the main goal that this whole organization has and you people have, and we've never lost sight of it, is cost of production plus a reasonable profit in all commodities. And we sit there and look at actually what that'll really totally do to everything. It's amazing. We look at our own operations right now. What do we do? We're out there trying to cut costs, buy feed a little bit cheaper, do this type of thing. Well, that's the same thing that Reagan's doing right now, isn't it? If we get this job done, a cost of production plus a reasonable profit, he's going to have to worry about how to spend all the money, not how to cut the budget. Thank you. We've been talking about the goals of the organization. In each commodity department, back in August, set out the goals for their departments. In dairy, we brought it back. We brought our overall goal back, took it out to our area directors, and asked them to tell us what they needed and how they were going to get the job done in their particular area. At these commodity meetings, we have had different area directors at each one. Today we've got Rick Avila from the Vermont, New York, Maine area, and this time I'm going to let Rick take over and tell us a bit about his area. Thank you, Al. Pleasure to be here this afternoon. Uh, I work in the New England area, which is Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, the eastern portion of New York, Massachusetts, and both producers in Rhode Island. They'll catch that one in a little bit. Okay. <laughs> we, had, uh, we have a rather small unit. You heard Gene Paul this morning say that he was going on first because he was the best looking. Walter Albers was the second fellow on, and he has the most seniority in the dairy division. And Gene pa or Gene, or Steve Pavich will be on later, and he has the largest uh, division in the dairy division, or largest area in the dairy division. And so to build up to that, they put on old BP fellow here, Avila, to come in and kind of build up to uh, the largest area. One of the things that we're trying to develop, and it just tickles me to sit and listen to, to Ted, because both Ted's, not just one, both of them. Because I can pick things out of what both of them say. Back over the years in the areas, and some of the reasons that we haven't grown is because we developed our own techniques out there. A good portion of them were wrong, but we kept on doing it because we had limited success with enrolling people into the organization. Now take what Ted Strait said here and begin to look at it as a, as a pyramid. We're properly training them. They're going out into the country, and that begins as individuals go out and react to other individuals. You're building a base, a very strong base to build off of. So what they have to do then is in the retraining process, each of the people that go out of here properly trained will be training staff properly. We won't be picking up the bad habits of some of us old timers that had years ago and uh, wanting to argue and fight with the people. So it, when you begin to really see the concept of it, and I'm going to take Ted on here for just a minute in something he said earlier, and I, so that you understand it, because I, I might have got a misunderstanding of what he said. We are bargaining. We just don't have the volume to take it all the way to cost of production, because each and every day we are bargaining out there, and people are reacting to what we and the staff and the departments and the, and the dairy division working together they are reacting to what we're doing out there. We just don't have the sufficient volume to be able to take it all away. And I'm sure that's what you meant. Okay, in, a, in New England area, we've had a, a problem that has been historic out there for a long period of time. And that is we have good big movement in the fall. The spring flush hits us. The milk has to move out of the area. The pay price Womp, goes, hits rock bottom. We lose the momentum. We lose the producers. We start back in the fall, and we build it back up. And this has been that roller coaster that we've been on. We've had other problems involving the industry, consolidations, mergers within the industry, the loss of markets. In other words, when we've had somebody that we've been able to do business with, they've either gone bankrupt 
they merged or consolidated, so they've limited the outlets that we've had. What we're attempting to do is to take advantage and be in a position to take advantage of situations as they arise. And I think each of, area can, each of your areas can relate back to the times when, boy, I just wish we would have had a staff of 100 people that we could have moved in during the AMPI mergers, for example, if we'd have had the staff to be able to put in there and really uh, inform the people of what was happening. Same situation happened out east. If we would have had the availability of funds to move an extra 50 or 75 people in there a couple of years ago and been able to take over, we, because...